First of all, I wish to uh, compliment, sincerely compliment Sanskriti Foundation for having uh, succeeded in managing this uh, large audience with much distinction. I'll be less than honest if I do not confess that I'm enormously overwhelmed to be designated as a chief guest. I am here essentially because I felt unable to say no to Sri Uma Maheshwar Rao Garu. It is he who persuaded me to come here and I am therefore standing before you to say, make a few remarks. Definitely not thinking that I am competent to be a chief guest on this uh, very special occasion. The lady who asked us to come to the guys said that the subject of cultural nationalism is multi-dimensional. I suppose you'll agree that one of those dimensions is something to do with technology and innovation. I feel encouraged to mention this partly because I find some people here who practice the same craft. If you look at, I mean, you can look at the heritage of science and technology in many ways, many ways, mathematics and so on, astronomy and so on. But let's look at metallurgical heritage. I mentioned this metallurgical heritage because of one very special reason. Today, many high technology systems, whether it's aircraft or a nuclear reactor or whatever you can think of, has become possible, have become possible because of the role uh, that uh, the materials engineers have played. But look at the past. I must preface, uh, <clears throat> before referring to the past briefly, preface uh, with the following remarks. So if you want to make a product, whether it's materials product, metallurgical product, or a polymeric based post, any kind of product. You need a process to realize that product. You need a manufacturing process to realize that product. And the manufacturing process, or the process which makes this product, should be so designed as to achieve the desired properties in that product. I don't want to make it very technical, but you aim at a certain qualifications for the product because it must perform a particular function in a high technology system or in any system. And in order to enable it to perform that function, it has to have certain characteristics. So the process that you, that you design, innovate, should be such that that product performs the desired function. So it's in that context I want to uh, tell you that we have a very proud metallurgical heritage. It goes back to Indus Valley bronzes, 2,500 years before Christ. And every few hundred years thereafterwards, I assembled something like seven of them. I just mentioned them, I'm not going to tell you the story about all of them, each one of them requires a one hour lecture to describe all its uh, very special features. So it was 2500 before Christ, it is uh, Indus Valley bronzes. And 600 before Christ, the innovation of downward distillation to make the zinc metal. Then 300 before Christ, a product called wood steel about which I'll mention and make a few remarks. Then <clears throat> subsequently after Christ, 300, 1600 years ago, we had this uh, Delhi iron pillar, then the Chola bronzes, then the Bidriware in Hyderabad in 1480, 
and uh, somewhat more recently, uh, a product from Kerala called Aranmula mirror, which is a metallic mirror which reflects from the top surface. Now, all of these, uh, you can call them artifacts. It's not that they're manufactured in large numbers. A few of them were, were made in uh, some kind of quantities. But every one of these seven examples that I just mentioned involved a process innovation. So the point that I want to underscore is that the culture of innovation pervaded our ancient history, any kind of history that you, you can think of. So in order to illustrate how complex some of these innovations are, I'll spend just a couple of minutes on one of those innovations and the so-called wood steel, because my distinguished colleague Balak Balsaburman here knows all about that. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time. It's not very far away in the Deccan, in the, in the part of India that we live in, that uh, <clears throat> this process was innovated. So it's a special kind of steel. It's called wood steel. Of course, there are many interpretations why it was called woods. But uh, since we are in Andhra Pradesh, we can say it is a corrupted form of wukku, and so it's wood steel. May not be that's the reason, but anyway, leave that aside. The steel was made in small quantities, in crucibles. The crucibles were made of clay, strengthened by natural fiber. Actually, <clears throat> materials engineers should recognize this as a remarkable discovery. Because today, we make what are called ceramic matrix composites, reinforced ceramic matrix composites. Matrix is ceramic. It can also be strengthened by a ceramic fiber, whatever or a particle, and becomes a ceramic matrix composite. This crucible was an example of a ceramic matrix composite, made of clay, strengthened by natural fiber. It could withstand the high temperatures. So in this crucible, they melted an iron ore, actually smelted an iron ore, using charcoal from wood, wood cuttings. And they also had some leaves from some of those trees and they used glass and they heated it to temperatures not above the melting point of iron and so it was reduced in the solid state. That's why it's called some kind of a sponge iron. The point that I want to mention is the product had very high carbon, 1.5% carbon. The reason why I want to emphasize this is if you were to make high carbon material today, it would be called cast iron. You know, our water meters in the house, they're all very corrosion resistant. They are made of cast iron. This cast iron is very brittle. If you take a hammer and beat it, it will break like glass, very brittle. However, these nuggets of iron buttons, steel buttons that they made in this crucible process, they subjected it to repeated heating and annealing. They annealed it, and then heated it. So some kind of repeated cycles of heating and forging. And this would be called a thermomechanical processing step, which is also something which we practice today in high technology materials processing. And then the resulting material was such, as I told you, this was long, long ago, 300 BC. This was the first time it was made at a time when even an optical microscope was not available. In other words, they had no tool with which they could examine the interior of this material. Yet, they produced an internal structure in the steel such that it could be forged to very thin sections. Not brittle. It's very malleable. So they made swords, Damascus swords were made out of the steel. They were very sharp, 
very thin, very hard, very hard because of high carbon. But the process that they had innovated was such that it could be forged to very thin sections so as to be able to make a sword. The swords were very, very strong. They said they could cut through a European helmet and still not blunt the edge. No, it was a remarkable, it was a remarkable product innovation. And between 1600 and 1700 AD, something like six tons of these nuggets of steel, they're small nuggets, like nuggets of gold, were exported to Europe for making these swords. I would say, without any hesitation, if you were to export six, six tons of gallium arsenide, which is an elect, semiconduct electronic material, it would be equivalent to that accomplishment, what these people achieved. I must tell you a little story. I want to relax this, uh, this whole assembly a little bit. I first came to know about this uh, material for, uh, from an American. I was uh, directed DMRL here, Defense Metallurgy Research Laboratory. One day, <clears throat> a lady called me from the security. They were not allowing her inside, saying that she wanted to talk to me. And uh, I, talk, I listened to her. I found her voice very earnest. She was a PhD student from University of Berkeley, California. She said she wanted to use some microscopes in the lab. And she had some material from the Deccan which she wanted to examine. I found her very earnest. So I broke a rule and I said, allow her to come. And that is the first time that I exposed to the mysteries of this material. And I found this lady very earnest. She took 10 years to do her PhD. She passed away recently. She was middle-aged even then. And uh, it was a remarkable uh, effort, I must say, on the part of an American student to go through enormous trouble. She went to Amsterdam for a period of two years and spent many hours in the port to find out exactly what kind of, what kind of quantities were exported from this part of India to Europe. So, so it's, it's a very, so what I wanted to say was, and you can talk about this kind of innovation. So every part of that process, whether the crucible, whether the thermomechanical processing, or even the kind of material that they used, and I'm told that that's a very special kind of location from which the war was obtained. In 2006, as late as just about 10 years ago, a German group tried to unravel the mystery of this material and found that its internal structure had nano features. Nano means ninth to the power of nine, minus nine nano features, which talk, we talk about nanoscience and nanotechnology very, very <clears throat> enthusiastically nowadays. So this material had nano features, and I don't want to describe them, to not both them which actually conferred upon this material these kinds of, uh, these kinds of characteristics. So, in fact, many of these artifacts, so-called artifacts, have been revisited by using new tools that are available to material scientists today to find out how exactly this is made. But the point that I want to emphasize is this culture of innovation. This is a culture of innovation as part of this cultural nationalism. I'm not saying that the culture of innovation has vanished. I will never say that. There is culture of innovation even today. But, and of course, science and technology have advanced phenomenally. And um, so if you want to find equivalence of those processes, process innovations, it's not easy. It's not easy. I'm sure there's, there are examples. But the, the, by and large, by and large, we are not able to compete with the West because we have not, I think, uh, enlarged the domain of this uh, culture of innovation. Today, I mean, I'm not an America file, but then today, United States is regarded by the world as a whole as a hub of innovation. If you go to Silicon Valley, so every other fellow is trying to innovate something. Now, I want to conclude with a few remarks. 
So if you see United States and you admire their capability in terms of innovating so many things, whether it's Google or all kinds of things, I don't want to reel, off, reel them off. There's so many internet is also came, in, came from that country. Some people, some people believe that it's the freedom, the freedom that uh, is given to the individual in the United States that's responsible for uh, this kind of across the board innovating capability, innovating you know, achievements in innovation. The American Declaration of Independence has one word. It confers upon the individual pursuit of happiness, the freedom to pursue happiness. It's a very, very interesting expression. But the point that I want to say is, the only other country other than the United States where the individual enjoys unlimited freedom is our country. I don't think, I don't think you can name another country where there is so much freedom. And yet, why is it that we are not able to compete with a country like United States in, term, in terms of innovations that have taken the entire world by surprise? It's not an easy question to answer. It's not an easy question to answer. So let me not attempt any answer. Why is it that we are not able to perform like United States? Calls for ecosystem and all kinds of things. But let me not attempt an answer. But that, that question that I want to raise today <coughs> as part of this function. So we should really raise this question. But then I want to end not on a, on a note such as that, but something else. What is it that we have in this country that, we, that makes us proud, that should make us proud? I mentioned this on some other occasion, and according to me, what we have in this country is a rich richness of minds. I want to borrow a phrase, a beautiful mind, a biography, a remarkable biography written by, I mentioned this in some other occasion, a Beautiful Mind by Sylvia Nasser, which is, which is the story of John Nash, the great mathematician who died recently in an air crash, mm -hmm. in a car crash. The man who won the Nobel Prize was in Princeton. And after a while, he went actually, I mean, he suffered mental illness. And he thought that he was getting messages from extraterrestrial sources. So we have had also remarkable people like that. Ramanujan, for instance, was also a mathematician. He also believed that he got messages from Namakal Deity. In fact, I must tell you, if you don't mind, I went all the way to Namakal and made it a point to sit in the same place where he was supposed to be dreaming opposite uh, <coughs> the statue, the idol of the Deity. So we have these examples, but I want to end this. I'm, I'm sure there are beautiful minds in this audience. There are beautiful minds adorning the dais. So this country, I think, is rich in beautiful minds. But I want to end this brief set uh, of remarks with one beautiful mind that I want to quote, and that's Gurudev Tagore. Tagore is known to be a playwright. He's been a poet and he's an artist, he's a phenomenal intellect. But not many people know that toward the end of his days, sometime around 1937, he also thought about science. And I want to read a passage. He wrote a, he wrote a remarkable piece called Vishwa Parichai. It's about looking at um, so-called skies, Vishwa Parichai, trying to understand the universe. It's written in Bengali, translated in Hindi. But I want to read one passage uh, in English, of course. Very, very small passage. The fact that an atom is, in, is distinguished, is disintegrable, which you can't break it, 
has prompted scientists, this is from Tagore, not from a scientist, has prompted scientists to devise machines that can penetrate inside the atom. These machines send radiation deep inside the atom to probe, to probe, its, to probe its internal structure. The Large Hadron Collider in Geneva is indeed a successor to su such machines that Tegu spoke of. And it's in those machines that so-called Higgs boson, which is referred to as God particle, was discovered. It's, uh, it's fascinating to wonder how Tagore, who was nowhere near a scientist or science, could, uh, could envision something like this. So this country is rich in those minds. And all that, I'm told, at, at, in all ages, young and old, and it's our duty, those who are getting old like me, to find ways and means of nurturing those young minds which have to develop into some things, uh, some kind of individuals who can actually uh, become world leaders in innovation. Thank you.